are these people? A doozy. Another one about the UAW and about labor unions and about how not all labor unions are wonderful. All right. Now, remember, we've been Sorry, co- children. Yep. We've been covering that the UAW had to have a federal monitor because of all the corruption and that they had uh-huh. uh, that the NLRB had had to basically bust them up and send. They had they had officers go to jail, embezzling, all kinds of stuff was happening. So they hiya. Hiya is so right, weak. Uncle Roger. So weak. So weak. So this UAW monitor <laughs> for months has been trying to get access to documents, work with them, and find out what the hell's going on um, about voting, about all kinds of things. But they're citing continuing culture of fear of retaliation in their latest status report. Oh boy. So Again, this is from Shannon Jones over at World Socialist website. I know it's kind of hard to see. WSWS.org. I have my issues with some of their stuff, but as far as holding labor unions accountable, they are about the best that there is. Because they think that everybody's corrupt. And you know what? They're right. Nice. Uh, Gregory Walker, slide the tip in here. Come on, man. Family show. But yes, we we do accept tips. Thank you. Yes, tips, tips. Aha. Okay. Thanks. Hobo. Good to see you. All right. In a status report filed July 12th, the court appointed UAW monitor Neil Borofsky cited a continuing culture of fear and retaliation within the UAW apparatus and noted widespread reports by staff of unethical behavior or misconduct within the union's leadership. Ah, Nothing to see here. Sean Fain? No. Sean Fain's got nothing to say. While couched in diplomatic language, the monitor paints a picture of a corrupt UAW bureaucracy riven by factional infighting and resistant to implementing even the cosmetic reforms put in place by the monitor in the wake of a corruption scandal that sent two former UAW presidents to prison. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yes, there is. (laughs) The report follows... He fell in... Felons are people too, Indy. God. Yeah, we have to pay for them. (laughs) They're kind of grifters. Yeah. Much more so than any of the podcasters that I know. But (laughs) the report follows by less than one month, the ninth status report in which Borofsky complained of lapses in compliance with monitors oversight. That's very kind. In particular, the failure of the UAW leadership to provide thousands of requested documents related to misuse of union funds and other potentially criminal acts. Yep. Nothing to worry about here. All right. On July 8th, the monitor filed a motion in federal court seeking to force the UAW to hand over documents he'd requested. The monitor asserted in court filing that the UAW stonewalling made his office unable to effectively carry out his responsibility to remove fraud, corruption, illegal behavior, dishonesty, and unethical practices from the UAW. Why? Now, Indy, I sent you something today. It's because they don't what want it removed. You? Oh, yes. Well. What did, what did I send you? It's it's the, Tell the people what I sent you. They're endorsing Cam Cam already. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Already, she already put on the comfortable shoe for them. You know? Oh, yeah. that's going to be fun. That's going to be great. The monitor's most recent filing cites the results of a cultural assessment conducted by a third-party internal audit that surveyed hundreds of UAW staff. It notes that of the approximately 100 union staff who reported that they witnessed unethical behavior or misconduct during the 12 months prior to the survey, <laughs> over 30% said they did not report it. Why? All survey participants were asked why they wouldn't report it. And in response, over 40% said they would decline to report out of fear of retaliation. What do you mean? Calls to the monitor's hotline have independently and repeatedly echoed these same concerns. Among the allegations the monitor is investigating are instances of retaliation against Margaret Mock and Rich Boyer, we, which we've covered before, the latter was removed by Fain as the head of the union's Stellantis department. 
Boyer alleges that Fain asked for favors for his domestic partner and her sister that would have violated the UAW ethical practices codes and financial practices. Fain's fiance works for the UAW Chrysler National Training Center in Michigan. Fain previously was a co-director for the NTC, which has served for decades as a conduit for hundreds of millions of dollars in corporate cash into UAW coffers. This unseemly faction fight within the UAW leadership, along with allegations and counter-allegations of corrupt practices, comes as anger among rank-and-file workers is boiling over the 2023 contract betrayal, as well as the UAW's endorsement of genocide Joe Biden, and now, of course, Cam Cam laughing clown Kamala. Last month... Yep. Last month, the union apparatus was barely able to contain a rebellion by 48,000 UAW academic workers in California who stage a political strike against the Gaza genocide and the brutal suppression of campus protests. They were barely Did able come. to contain a rebellion. Why should mm -hmm. they? What? I don't want We've them to We've got you surrounded. <laughs> At the same time, a federal judge recently ruled in favor of socialist rank and file Mack Trucks worker Will Lehman in his lawsuit against voter suppression in the sham 2022-23 election, which brought Fain to power in the first place and the reformer ticket. Both the Monitor and the U.S. Department of Labor had sided with the UAW bureaucracy in attempting to block Lehman's complaint before from being considered on its merits, but not anymore, I don't believe. In a footnote to his report, the monitor, Borofsky, acknowledged that the union's record-keeping practices were subject to several challenges by union members in an oblique reference to Lehman's charges that the UAW refused to update members' mailing addresses so they could receive ballots to vote in the election. That was part of his detailed complaint that the UAW did as little as possible to inform members during the first ever direct elections of top union officers. That's really important. And I'm going to stop right there because in the history of the Teamsters, I mean, the UAW, it was only the Barnes, the, the, like the captains and the, 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 the leaders of the different um, um, locals that voted for union leadership. And there are like 160 locals and they represent everybody that's part of that union. And a lot of times the union members would feel like their vote wasn't represented because how they felt was never recorded on the books because their barn or, you know, their, their local didn't feel the same way and didn't right. vote the way they did. This gave them direct voice for the first time. And it scared the shit out of leadership because they didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, the last thing that, that leadership wants is an unpredictable vote. So they did what they had to to rig it, according to Lehman, allegedly. And, allegedly. It's, and it's still coming out in federal court that this is exactly what they did. All right. That uh, Borowski seeks to dismiss Lehman's complaints by citing the Department of Labor's whitewash of the UAW bureaucracy. That's insane. He's working in cahoots with UAW leadership, the federal monitor. He's working <laughs> against Will. Why? Yeah. Because uh, I, I don't know why. Because he's getting stonewalled by the current administration. Lehman would, would at least come in and give him the transparency that he's looking for. Shame. Shame. Right? Shame. Shame while pointing to a culture of fear and retaliation among bureaucrats within the UAW apparatus, the Monitor's report predictably says nothing about the overt lies and intimidation tactics used by the bureaucracy to ram through the 2023 Big Three Agreement and other sellout contracts. This included promoting false claims that the supposed record contract, which, rate, which contained pay raises that didn't even keep pace with inflation, guaranteed the promotion of temporary workers with more than nine months experience to full-time work. In fact, Delantis and other auto companies started mass firings and layoffs shortly after the contracts were signed. 
and there was nothing that UAW could do about it. Nothing. Nothing. Vane what do you remo- want to do? Vane then removed Boyer nothing. for... That, yeah, but, but what's crazy, Vane removed Boyer for dereliction of duty, alleging that he agree, agreed to separate concessions which have undermined the, the jobs and conditions of Stellantis workers. Boyer shot you back... what? Yep. Boyer shot back with a widely circulated internal memo revealing that Fain and other executive board members were fully aware that the promises he and Fain made to temporary <laughs> workers to sell the contract were lies. They tried to uh-huh. hang this guy out to dry it. He dragged the receipts right out and said, fuck you. If you're taking me down, I'm taking you all down with me. Uh-huh. Nor did the monitor note, uh. note the strong arm tactics that the UAW used to force through the contract at Mack Trucks in McCungie, Pennsylvania. All right, that's where Will works, I believe. Striking workers were told by the UAW leaders that they would be replaced by scabs and abandoned to their fate if they didn't vote to ratify a sellout deal that they had previously rejected. Seriously, this is crazy. The continuing yeah. revelations of UAW corruption make more urgent than ever the call by the International Workers Alliance of Rank-and-File Committees for a new UAW elections under the control of Rank-and-File. You would think that the workers would actually, like, fight for this, but they don't either know or don't care enough to fight for it, apparently. I, I don't understand it. The aim of this would be to throw out the corrupt leadership and implement a radically new course aimed at putting power in the hands of the rank-and-file and abolishing the bureaucracy. Rank-and-file workers should also demand access for independent review of all the concealed UAW documents. Right? Uh-oh. Not the documents. Oh, yeah. Referring to the recent like. move by Fain to strip uh, Mock and Boyer of key duties, the monitor wrote, specifically, reports to the monitor's hotline from union staff have cited the actions taken against the secretary, treasurer, and vice president as driving retaliation fears that reporting alleged abuses might lead to retribution from the president's office. Uh Uh-huh. Wait, what, 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 what was that again? Yes. If, if we say something, we might get in trouble. Yep. That's basically what they're saying. All right. Given the fragility Mm. of the union's cultural perception of retaliation, listen to all this corporo speak. All right. Um, whether they're appropriate or not, how recent these acts are perceived. God almighty, it's just talking around this. How recent these acts are perceived by the union staff must be taken into account when tackling this persistent cultural challenge. Like, what, what, what? The monitor is just talking around himself. Keep it secret. Keep it secret. All right. The monitor also pointed to the decision by Fain to take over duties such as procurement. That's purchasing. All right. right. Formerly under Secretary Treasurer Mock's office, he cautioned that the charges risk diluting the role of Secretary Treasurer as a potential independent check on actions that pertain to financial approvals and oversight of expenditures. So now you're removing any kind of a check on the president's balance. Right. And now especially when it comes to spending money. The union must tread care. Where's and they, the money, Lebowski? Yeah, and this is, this is a presidency that already got accused of embezzling a million dollars plus. Not Sean right. Fain. Not Sean Fain, but somebody in that position. So now they're trying to loosen the chains so that he could do the same thing? What? what? Right? Yeah, yeah. So the union must yeah. tread carefully in removing the potential checks and balances on authority, especially those that contain that concern financial matters, given the union's history of financial corruption, the cultural concerns still present at the union, and the relative nascency of its compliance program. Right. The fact that they're stonewalling, that they're not giving out any information, and they're trying to make this go away. The monitor's report also recited a list of areas where the UAW was delaying implementing reforms that it had pledged to implement. For example, again, the the federal monitor, Borofsky, said that little had been done to implement the UAW's new conference and events expense policy. No surprise. 
He cautions that in prior reports, the monitor highlighted the need for additional oversight and scrutiny of union conference and event expenses. But of course, they're not being forthcoming. In addition to the above, the monitor cited the union's foot dragging on establishing controls over procurement and vendor selection process, noting the union of the record of union officials enriching themselves through kickbacks on union branded merch. Okay. All, yep. Hey, no. UAW merch. That think about the amount of UAW members that buy UAW merch. That's not a little amount. All right. They want a little a little piece on everything. You know, it's like ugh. he also expressed again nepotism, cronyism, and hiring. Right. That that there there was no yeah, yeah. nothing done in procedures to reverse that practice. All of this only vindicates the warnings by Lehman that the replacement by one bureaucrat of one bureaucrat with another would do nothing to end the corrupt pro company character of the UAW apparatus or empower the rank and file. Only the formation of new democratically controlled rank and file committees can transfer power to workers on the shop floor, which of course the union has no interest in doing. The union is directly at odds with the rank and file workers here, and they can claim that they're not, but why, why are they hiding all this from a federal monitor? The deepening crisis at the UAW apparatus takes place alongside the mounting turmoil in the Democratic Party after Biden's disastrous Democrat debate performance against Trump. All right, of course, we know Biden styles himself as the most pro-union president in history and who recently called it the AFL-CIO his domestic NATO, meaning that they're Nazis too? No, no, bad. Has been endorsed by the mm -hmm. UAW apparatus, and of course they're now endorsing Kamala, and Fain has been one of his most loyal promoters. However, with the Democratic campaign in freefall, a Reuters report cites a source that claims the UAW leadership met last week to discuss concerns about Biden's re-election chances and is considering its next options. Yeah, it sure did. It got in line. It, that's what it did. <laughs> You're done year down right so whatever the truth of these assertions the fact is that the uaw apparatus and the democratic party are deeply discredited in the eyes of workers for facilitating the israeli genocide against palestinians supporting the u.s on uh, the ongoing u.s backed proxy war in ukraine against russia and enforcing de declining living standards and job cuts at home Whatever the outcome in November, workers face an existential fight against the destruction of living standards and democratic rights at home and the threat of global war. Nothing fundamentally changes. They are interchangeable. It is a uniparty. It's crucial that workers take the measure of the UAW bureaucracy and prepare a rebellion to overthrow the union apparatus and transfer power to the workers themselves. I'd love to see that happen, like, federally, too, where we overthrow the federal government and transfer powers to the peoples themselves. But that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Democracy simply doesn't work. Nope. Well, it can, but not when it's corrupted by corporate interests and unlimited donor. But such a struggle must be based on the understanding that workers face a fight, not just against this or that any or that employer or that this or that employer, but against the entire capitalist setup its political parties, the Democrats and Republicans, as well as the UAW servants of big business. So, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted with these guys. Um, WSWS does a good job. Um, you know, somebody's got to call this stuff out because I don't see anybody else talking about the UAW federal monitor except for in red states where it's an inconvenient thing where they're trying to gotcha the Democrats who have aligned with the union. But in a blue state, we don't hear about this at all, ever. We have to look for this. All right. All right. Woohoo! We have, we have gotten to that portion of the program, folks. Um, mm. American Dad did a whole story on the gas mafia. Very funny, Cowboy K Kitty. Yep. The Dems would do anything for unions as long as the unions vote with them. Yes. Uh, totally agree, cookies. Um, you know, everybody, I guess. Just, they want to squash your strike. And they're, then, then they do that. 
Uh huh. They, you they know. quell protests, rig elections, elevate corporate friendly presidents. Yeah. Just like a Democrat should. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, yep. it's really bad. What's the point of a union? Is that a, see, this is my problem with unions is that they add a third middleman in there that has a completely different agenda from the individual worker. And that is the, the existence of the union. Are reformist in nature. But it's the existence of the union itself. It's the fact that it has to have a presence uh -huh. and an authority in the first place. That is the problem. Well, you see, Andy, the thing is... There's, the, there's always the macro, and then there's the micro. No. So... No, there's not. 